Hi everyone, we are on to activity two. And just to review a bit in activity one, activity one was all about simple diffusion. And diffusion is a blanket term for a set of processes. All of these processes involve passive transport of molecules in solution. That means that there is no energy involved in moving these molecules through a solution. And the umbrella term of diffusion covers simple diffusion, which you saw in activity one, and osmosis, which we're going to do in activity two, and facilitated transport, which we are not going to discuss in this lab. So when we were working with activity one and simple diffusion, we were working with small molecules. You can remember simple, small molecules, right? And with osmosis in activity two, we're going to be looking at larger molecules. Now, we were talking about things they have in common, and you know that all of diffusion has a semi-permeable membrane in common. When we were doing activity one, we were dealing with a, um, a violet solution that produced black in the potato, right? And when we were um, working with that solution, we put a few drops of that solution into water and mixed it all up we created a solution. A solution is a solvent, which is the majority of the molecules, which was the water in our case, and a solute, which, is, which are minority molecules, not as many molecules as the solvent. We could have one solute, we could have two solutes, we could have many solutes in a solution, but the majority of molecules are always going to be the solvent. And we can talk about the relative uh, concentration of the solute in solution. And when we talk about the relative concentration of the solute, we use these bracket bars. And we talk about the concentration of the solution by, by using that shorthand of those bracket bars. The calculation we're going to use for concentration of a solution is the mass of the solute over the mass of the solvent. So in other words, the molecule that we're using in activity two, we're gonna be using sugar. Sugar is the solute over the mass of the solvent, which is water. And we're gonna be multiplying that times 100. Now you're probably going to say, I have no idea um, what the mass of the solute is. I have this bag of sugar and I have no idea what the mass of the water is because all I've got is a graduated cylinder. I don't have a scale. But you do know what the mass of the sugar is because you have a bag of 100 grams of sugar. Now you're supposed to have a second bag of 50 grams of sugar. I didn't have that. So I just measured out about roughly half of the volume of my first bag, and I use that as my second bag. You can do that too. So you are essentially getting mass by volume, and that's fine because you know that you have a bag of sugar, and you know that that was 100 grams, and you are gonna be measuring out with volume about half that, and that will be roughly 50 grams of sugar, all right? and you are measuring in a graduated cylinder for your, um, for your water. And in that graduated cylinder with water, it is one gram per cc. So even if you are looking at um, cc's of water, you can convert water to one gram to cc. That's the beauty of having water as a solvent, and that's part of the reason it's called the universal solvent part um, of the reason it's so simple to work with. The other part of the reason it's called the universal solvent is because water is polar with its H's and its O's, and it can really um, um, take on many different solutes. So we are going to be using mass of our sugar over mass of our solvent times 100 to get concentrations of solutions. Well, what good is that gonna do for us? Well, let's think about what happened in your activity one. In your activity one, you had a solution which had this dye, and your dye was the solute in water, so you had a solution there. We didn't measure the concentration there, but certainly there was more dye in the solution at the beginning of the experiment than there was dye in the potatoes, which didn't have any dye at all.
And so that solute was more concentrated in the solution, certainly, than in the potato. And we have a cell membrane which is semi-permeable on the potato. The cell membrane decides what is going to be let in and what is not going to be let in. In the case of the potato, it was a semi-permeable membrane that had very specific sizes to its permeability, to its ability to let in molecules. It certainly let in these very small dye molecules, and these dye molecules went right through the, um, the semi-permeable membrane of the potato. And so we had a black solution in the cup, and then there was black in the potato as well. And you know what? These, this semi-permeable membrane is such that these dye molecules can also go this way. They can bounce around and go back and forth along the semi-permeable membrane. That was in activity one. Now let's talk about what's going to happen in activity two, which is going to be different, and it's going to be osmosis for larger molecules. In activity two, we're going to be using a dye, and we are also going to be using sugar as well. So we are going to be using food dye, our nice small molecule, and we'll have a concentration of food dye as the mass of that food dye over the mass of our solvent water times 100. And let's say our food dye is in solution F, and it is the red F marks in here, nice and small. And in the same solution, we're going to be adding another solute. We're going to be adding sugar. And so we can have a concentration of sugar. We can calculate that concentration by the mass of the sugar over the mass of the solvent, our water, times 100. And let's say in solution A, we have our sugar molecules here. In solution B, we're not going to put food dye. We're going to have a concentration of food dye that will equal zero. But we are going to have sugar. And we are going to have the same concentration, the same number of molecules per mass uh, as we do on solution A can compare these solutions and we have a vocabulary in science to compare these solutions. So let's compare the solution of food dye first in solution A and solution B and give a vocabulary to it. Well, when we have a vocabulary, we kind of relate things to what we know. And we know that when there's a relationship between two people, sometimes there's some tension. And when we know that there's a relationship between two solutions, there can be tension too. And when we refer to it in science, tension, we know it as tonicity. That's our word for it. When we've got a higher concentration of food dye in solution A, we can say that that is a hypertonic solution relative to solution B. So these relationships are always relative to other solutions. One solution, one solution. We, we, we name the relationship between the two of them. When there's more concentration of food dye in solution A, it is hypertonic to the food dye solution in, um, in solution B. Because before we start this experiment, there is no concentration of food dye in solution B. So we call this hypertonic in greater concentration, hypotonic, low tension in the solution that has less concentration. Well, that suits for our food dye concentration. What about our sugar concentration? Our sugar concentration has equal masses on both in both solutions. The concentration of sugar in solution A is the same as the concentration of sugar in solution B. Our vocabulary for that is to call those concentrations isotonic to each other. So there is your vocabulary, hypertonic solution relative to another solution, and the other solution will be hypotonic, or they could be isotonic to each other. We are relating this before anything happens on this semi-permeable membrane. But you know something's going to happen. Because as soon as we start this out, this is a dynamic equilibrium. 
meaning that this equilibrium is going to move across its gradient of concentration. And we have a higher concentration of food dye on one side. And these are small molecules. So they are going to move through the semipermeable membrane. And they're going to move back through the semipermeable membrane and move back and move forth. And suddenly, this is going to be a little less red in its solution. And this is going to become a little more red in, in its solution. In other words, in solution A, we're going to lose the mass of some of the F food dye molecules. So the mass of the um, food dye molecules in solution A is going to decrease while the mass of food dye molecules in solution B is going to increase. That's going to change each concentration. And the concentration of solution A for food molecules is going to decline because when you decrease the numerator, your quotient is going to decrease as well. And the concentration of the food dye in solution B is going to increase because we are increasing the numerator here. Eventually, these concentrations will be equivalent as this one declines for A and this one increases for B. Eventually, these concentrations of food dye will be isotonic and they will equal each other. And at that point, the solution will reach a dynamic equilibrium where the food dye is heading in one way or heading back out through the semipermeable membrane. But both of these solutions are maintaining the same concentration of food dye. They'll also, they'll all, both become a version of pink because they'll be less red over here and they'll be more red over here. Let's talk about another solution and what's going to happen for sugar. Now we have sugar here and we have three sugar molecules in solution A and three sugar molecules in solution B. Well, they're equally concentrated and that's good because they can't move. They're too big to get through the semipermeable membrane. And so we have an isotonic solution here that can't move on the concentration differences because there are no concentration differences and because the semipermeable membrane is too small. In this case, we say that the sugar concentrations in solution A and solution B are isotonic relative to each other. Well, what would happen if we put in more sugar into solution A? Let's put in more sugar into solution A. Hmm. If we put more sugar into solution A, that means it has more mass. That makes solution A hypertonic to solution B, which is hypotonic to solution A. That's the relationship. Now we have more mass in solution A. Well, that's a very fraught situation that's got to change, and we need to re establish a dynamic equilibrium or homeostasis. How are we going to do that? Because the sugar can't move. It can't move through the semipermeable membrane. There's got to be a solution to this. And there is. Because if the sugar can't move, the solvent can. The water can move. And that would be a good idea because there's so much sugar on this side that there's less water molecules now on this side. The sugar took up all the space. And there's less sugar on this side, and there's more water molecules on this side. So we have a difference in concentration of water. And we can send some of that water over here and increase the mass of the water. And in increasing the mass of the solvent, we are essentially increasing the mass of the denominator to decrease the concentration on solution A. So it makes sense to move the water across its own concentration gradient where it's higher concentration of water over here and lower concentration of water over here. In increasing the mass of the solvent in the denominator, we can decrease the concentration of A. Diluting the high concentration of sugar in solution A and bringing both sugar concentrations closer to isotonicity. See you on the next slide.